I have been balcony container gardening for probably five years now, and I have learned a lot through trial and error, plant friends. So today I've put together my top five common mistakes I've made, I've seen other gardeners make in hopes to save you from some tears, the tears that I've shed in order to help you have a thriving garden this summer on your balcony, in containers, in small spaces. Stay tuned because the last tip of the five is definitely the most embarrassing. Hi, plant friends. I'm Maria. I'm your new best plant friend, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and more importantly, grow joy while doing so. I'm so excited to make this video for you today in partnership with Espoma Organic, going over the top five gardening mistakes that I see for people who grow in containers on patios. Patio balcony gardening is a beast of its own. There are a lot of factors that apply specifically just to patio gardeners that I want to go over with you so you don't mistakenly avoid them and then fail and then be sad and then maybe not garden anymore. I would never want that to happen. So let's get you growing successfully. Tip number one is choose the right varieties of plants that you want to grow. When you're at the garden center, these are usually going to be labeled as either micro dwarf, dwarf or patio or maybe container varieties. These are plants that have been cultivated over the years to grow smaller and more compact so you can successfully grow them in containers. For example, I'm growing patio baby eggplant. It's an eggplant plant that is smaller and grows small little eggplants. It'll also kind of trail over the side of the pot. I'm growing tidy treats, cherry tomato. It's going to be a prolific cherry tomato plant, but it's going to grow only like a couple of feet tall. You can grow smaller flowers. If you're growing zinnias, you're going to want to choose the varieties that only get like 10 or 12 inches tall instead of the ones that can get four feet tall. Usually you can tell on the label if the label doesn't have like a tidy treat or a dwarf variety or patio on it. You could also turn the label around and just see how tall the plant gets and that will help inform you. You're going to struggle if you have a small balcony to grow a really epic tomato plant like a sweet 100 that could totally take over your entire balcony and then you're not going to have any more space to grow anything else. So sticking with the dwarf smaller varieties is going to allow you to grow more and a more diverse amount of food and flowers for you to enjoy all summer. Mistake number two I see a lot being made is not picking the right potting mix. So obviously, if you're growing in containers, don't put outdoor soil in your containers. It's too waterlogged, too clay heavy. It's going to have all sorts of weird stuff in it. But it's overwhelming sometimes when you go to the garden center and there's like a whole shelf of potting mixes and soils and composts and fertilizers, and you don't really know what to choose. So if you're gardening in containers, I'm going to recommend you do a Spoma Organic potting mix. You're going to want to look for a bagged potting mix that is used to growing in containers. When you grow in containers, the potting mix can get compacted. So you want to make sure it's aerated. It's got stuff like perlite and wood bark and all sorts of cool things. Espoma has them all to keep air in the soil as much as water because roots need air and water in order to thrive and grow strong. So the plants can grow lots of leaves and lots of fruit and flowers for you as well. When you're looking at composts, in containers, I'm not throwing a ton of compost in the container for the first round, but if I have this container, I grow in it, I'm putting potting mix and I'm putting biotope. This is a starter plant food. So when I plant up my container, I put the potting mix in, I put a little bit of this biotone starter plant food. It helps prevent transplant loss. It helps the roots absorb more water and water faster. Then next year, I'm going to use compost to amend this soil a little bit. So when you're gardening in containers, there's only plants only have the amount of soil in the container to absorb all of the nutrients. So once they absorb the nutrients in the existing soil, it's not as nutrient rich. So you can amend this with a little bit of compost. It'll help kind of turn it around and reinvigorate the soil for your next year of plants. You can also top dress with compost if you want. I like using a Spoma Organics mushroom compost in my containers because I find it's the least smelly of all composts. Their land and sea compost is also really amazing. But the key, key, key for container gardening is picking the right mix that's going to go in here. Don't buy a bag that says garden soil and put it in here. Don't buy a bag that says raised bed planter mix or, you know, topsoil and put it in here. You want potting mix for containers. Mistake number three I see is not having a watering plan. You are making a commitment to these plants. This is not a one and done bouquet of flowers. For me, I'm in zone six. 
I'm going to be tending to these plants June, July, August, and September. So you need to figure out a way that you can sustainably water your plants and potentially have to go on summer vacation and still have your plants be watered and fed. There's two different ways you can do this. Number one, I love self-watering planters. These three planters are self-watering planters. They have a water reservoir in the bottom and they bottom water the plants. So I can top water them if I want, or I can use this water reservoir that will bottom water for them. They also have a drainage plug. So if it rains, the excess water will come out the bottom. So no fear about that. If you're not going to go this route, for the last four summers, I grew in grow bags. I didn't have self-watering planters, but here's a hack that I learned. So if you have more than one grow bag, you're going to need probably more than one watering can. Have two watering cans. And believe me, these are not fancy. I bought these at the dollar store. Have two watering cans. So while I'm watering my plants with this watering can, this will be in the sink filling up. When this is over, when I'm out of water here, this will be full. I'll go grab it. I'll put this in the sink and then I'll come water here. So it's just an easier and faster way to get all of your plants watered. I also suggest watering in the morning before it gets too hot. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful time in the morning to have a mindful moment, have some peace with your plants, put your phone down, but make sure that you have a consistent watering schedule ideally two watering cans or self-watering planters. Because the saddest thing that could ever happen to you, plant friends, is you work hard on a beautiful tomato plant. Your tomato plant gets this big. You're so proud of it. It's setting fruit. You go away for the weekend. You forget to have a plant sitter come and water it. Or, you know, you don't have it in a self-watering planter. And that tomato plant shrivels up and all the fruit fall off. It has happened to me. It is so painful. I'm not going to lie. I might have cried when that happened. Don't let it happen to you. Make a watering plan. Okay. And one more watering thing, plant friends. This is very specific. If you're in an apartment complex and you have balconies above and below you, particularly below you, be mindful when you're watering your plants. If you're watering your plants, Make sure that the water isn't spilling over and accidentally giving your neighbor a shower that they don't want. Maybe they don't want a ton of water on their balcony or maybe the passersby. In my first apartment in New York City, I was on the fourth floor and multiple times because I was a New Yorker who didn't care about <laughs> about anyone else back in the day. I've much, I'm much more evolved now. I was watering my herbs and I totally sprinkled passerbys on the street. So Be mindful of the people around you, of your surroundings, and help everyone grow joy as you're growing joy alongside them. All right, mistake number four. This is a big one for me. I didn't do this for the first couple of years and I regret it, is remembering to fertilize your plants in containers. So here's why fertilizing is so important for container plants, sometimes arguably even more so than plants that are in ground. I'm growing these flowers in a grow bag with a finite amount of soil, right? So like I talked about before, These plants, when they absorb the water in the soil or in the potting mix, are going to also absorb the nutrients that are with the potting mix to help them grow big and strong. After they absorb the nutrients, there's no like infinite amount of soil that someone that a plant would have in a normal garden to replenish the nutrients that they need. They can't just keep growing their roots farther and farther out to get the nutrients that they need. So it's our responsibility to fertilize and replenish the soil with nutrients. So Throughout the gardening season, you're going to go in probably once a month, depending on what you're growing, and fertilize. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. Espoma Organic makes it extremely simple. Like I said, so when you plant the plants up, you're going to use their Biotone Starter plant food. That's what's going to get the plants started. And then depending on on what you're growing and depending on how you like to fertilize, you have a couple of options. If you like liquids, you can take one of their liquid fertilizers. The cap is the measuring. You put this in your watering can and you water your plants. Or you can use their granular options. This is what I like to use. You take some granules, you sprinkle the granules all over the soil, and then every time the plant gets watered, the granules, you know, liquefy and go into the soil and replenish and give the plants the nutrients that they need. Espoma has a long line of fertilizers. They're called their tones. So Garden Tone is a great general fertilizer for a garden bag that might have multiple things. But they have a flower tone. They have a rose tone. They have tomato tone, right, for your tomato plants. So they have these fertilizers that are tinkered specifically for whatever plants you're growing to help set those plants up for success. So Do your research, depending on what you're growing, they have a fertilizer for you, and then make sure you're doing it throughout the season to set your plants up for success. 
all season long and not just in the beginning. Next up is save your plant tags. Oh my gosh, one of my first years balcony gardening, I bought this incredible micro dwarf tomato plant that I swear to you probably put off 300 delicious yellow tomatoes and it was maybe this big. I loved it all summer and I forgot to save the plant tag. And the next year I could not for the life of me figure out what tomato it was. So save your plant tags, either put them in the planter with you, or if aesthetically you don't want like a jumble of a bunch of different plant tags, just save them, put them in a cupboard for the summer. And you can either get like uniform wooden sticks or beautiful, you know, ceramic labels, whatever you want and write them out. So you have a uniform aesthetic or just save them and know, Hey, what was the name of this type of oregano I was growing? Let me go find it in the stack of plants that I have. And last but not least, arguably the most embarrassing one, but it's not embarrassing because what I like to say is you don't know what you don't know. But a lot of balcony gardeners often mistake the amount of light that their plants can get on their balcony for a variety of reasons that is very specific to people who have balconies. So if you're in an apartment complex, kind of like I mentioned before, you might have a balcony that has a balcony above you, right? that balcony might cast shade on your balcony. So if you have a balcony that has 24-7 shade, you're not going to be able to grow edible plants like you want to unless you make some adjustments. Maybe your balcony railing, if you have a southern facing exposure, the balcony railing when the sun is over there might cast a shadow on your plants, right? And also you have to understand your ex- not just your exposure, but if you have obstructions, right? So when I lived in New York City and I had a balcony, I had southern facing balconies, but I had a building in front that blocked the sun, right? Maybe you have large trees. I'm lucky that my balcony has unobstructed views of the mountains and of the sun. My plants get tons of sun. But if you have a building, if you have a balcony, if you have a railing, there are lots or a tree and you got to be careful with trees because sometimes trees, the deciduous trees, you get light in the winter, but then you don't get light when they leaf out and then block the sun. So you have to be a super sleuth with your lighting. Some general rules of thumbs with lighting. Southern facing is the strongest for the northern hemisphere. East, uh, Western is the second strongest because the sun rises in the east. It's a little bit gentler as it moves across the sky. It gets a little bit stronger in the west. For me personally, that's west and that's east. So I get very gentle light in the morning because actually my house casts a little bit of a shadow onto this balcony. But then by noon, the sun is shining directly on the plants. And then from noon to eight in the summer, because the sun doesn't set until eight, my plants are getting eight hours of exposed light. But if I had a, you know, a building over there, or if I had a big tree right here for the most of the time that the sun was in the West, it would be blocking my plants. So you have to really take a minute, get out your phone see where your exposure is. Every phone has a compass on it. See where is south, where is east, where is west, where is north. If you have a northern balcony, it's going to be harder for you to grow edible plants because northern exposure is a lot lower light than southern exposure. So get your compass out and then get your eyeballs out. Now that I know where my exposures are, see what might be blocking the sun, see what isn't blocking the sun, And then when you understand that, you can make choices for what to grow. If you have lots of light, you're going to have the most opportunity to grow food. If you don't have a lot of light, lettuces and some tender herbs can be a little bit lower light tolerant. But depending on your situation, you can do Google. We have tons of podcast episodes for you all about balcony gardening, all about container gardening, low light gardening, high light gardening. Scroll our 240 episodes of podcasts and YouTube videos at your leisure. And I know I said it was embarrassing, but don't be embarrassed. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about gardening that we don't know intuitively, especially if you're living in an urban environment. When I started balcony gardening, I was a total plant killer. I thought that I had to water my plants only in the morning or only at night. I thought all sorts of weird things about my plants. I didn't fertilize. I made a lot of these mistakes. So no matter where you are in your gardening journey, don't feel bad, plant friend. That's the beauty of gardening. It is a lifelong hobby and every season we get to get better. Every season we get to make mistakes and then learn from them. Every season we get to grow amazing herbs, amazing flowers, amazing tomatoes. It's the best hobby ever. I hope these mistakes helped you. Please learn from them. 
please do as I say, not as I do sometimes. Thank you again to Espoma Organic for sponsoring this video. Definitely use their amazing lines of potting mixes, gardening soils, composts, fertilizers. No matter how you garden, raised beds, containers, in ground, they have the potting mix, soil, fertilizer, everything you need to grow happy, healthy, robust plants. Plus, they're an awesome company. And I hope this summer you keep growing joy.